Um, our next speaker is Alexi Marmot, um, who's Professor of Facility and Management here at UCL. Alexi is going to present an example of crossing disciplinary boundaries in investigating the built environment as a potential change agent. And she's going to do this in a rather um, interesting way, which she will explain. working in Tokyo. Now, those of you who don't hang out a lot with architects uh, won't have had the um, pleasure of many very, very long sessions with countless images that you're not quite sure why they're there, um, but maybe they're interesting and so you sort of stick with it. And so the group in Tokyo were concerned that they wanted to communicate with one another, they wanted to share experience, and they had to stop people showing so many slides. So they invented this chit-chat format, 2020, hopefully 2020 vision, but actually it's about 20 images, 20 seconds each. And I'm going to take the challenge today to give you a quick overview of some uh, thoughts about what it means to be talking about behavior change in the built environment. And when I press the button for the next slide, I'm afraid I'm going to have to try my best to keep to the time. Bear with me and see how it goes. So, I'm starting with Nudge, with um, Thaler and Sunstein's book, where they talk a lot about choice architects. Choice architects making decisions to help use human behavior, and they use, the, to help use human behavior to make change. They use the term architect because they believe that all architects use behavior to make changes. But in fact, most architects <coughs> believe in something called environmental determinism, where behavior that exists is not perhaps as interesting as behavior that might exist if one invents a different future, a different society, new towns, ideal places, utopia. Many other architects, though, believe that affordances is a better term, that simply what the built environment is about is providing a set of opportunities that either are taken up or not. And that really that's the role of the built environment. So these are pretty fundamental concepts. So now if we move to a topic that I know those involved in medicine in the room are interested in, smoking. When smoking first came to the UK, everyone realized it was pretty awful. <laughs> smelt a lot, and so those who smoked, clearly only men, had smoking jackets to protect themselves and smoking hats, but that wasn't enough, so they also created smoking rules. So the concept of spatial segregation of something which was otherwise perhaps deleterious to others was terribly important and stuck around for many years with absolutely beautiful uh, examples in hotels and luxury. <laughs> <laughs> and now, 50 years after most of the evidence is incontrovertible, these are our smoking rooms. It does make a difference to create environments that don't say, welcome, this is a place of privilege. And perhaps there is an association with the increasing drop in smoking. But now to turn to physical activity, which is something that uh, is, is, of course, of great importance as we see the rise in obesity and the associated health impacts, and something which those of us in the built environment believe that actually we are quite responsible for in many ways, uh, th possibly through past creation of cities. So, for example, the spatial map of a city like London here shows the dense areas, the red ones in the centre, where it's actually possible to have an active transport lifestyle if you happen to live and work there. But as you move out increasingly, 
it's impossible to come to work in any active way. Here is an example of a, of a subway station in uh, Stockholm, the Odenplan station, where the observation that everyone, given this point of choice between an escalator or a stair, used the escalator. So they then, overnight, turned the stairs into a functioning piano, and it changed behavior. Now, we know that there's lots of attempts to tell people what to do, to put up signs, to do experiments, control trials, whatever it might be. Some of them by incentive to lose calories, uh, some of them uh, just telling you that you'll actually help the planet by not using so much electricity. But really our buildings tend to tell us that a lift is a rather special place made of beautiful materials, expensive fabrics, and the stairs usually are not quite as welcoming as in this image. So um, the aim in, of um, quite a lot of people thinking about activity in buildings is to perhaps change the environment to encourage more activity. Uh, so we've currently got a project which is jointly uh, conducted here at UCL between the Epidemiology Department and the Bartlett School of Graduate Studies, funded by the National <coughs> Institute of Health Research, looking at active buildings. We've actually taken the example of office buildings, and one of the things we're looking at is the concept of hotspots, if you like, areas on floor plans which attract a whole bunch of activity, their location and what's in them can perhaps be a factor in how much movement goes on in buildings. Why do we look at this? Because people spend so much time in buildings, about 90% of their time. And then comes another piece of research which of course is growing evidence that sedentary behaviour as such may be uh, independently um, in, uh, causing part of the obesity problem, and that perhaps the very concept of seats is not to be continued. Now, the furniture industry has already developed alternatives, the sit-stand desk, uh, the treadmill desk, there's also a bicycle desk, um, all sorts of alternatives. And the idea that actually if one does spend something like eight hours a day for office workers in a, a sedentary lifestyle, perhaps that should change. Active meetings, Meetings while walking around, invitations to walk outside, meetings while standing up, again, is a growing trend. The evidence about its effect is um, perhaps less secure, but the study that uh, we're engaged in at the moment is trying to get more of the evidence. Now, in our world, I show this picture, Man Ray's picture of tears, because we talk not so much about behavior change as change management. And as a young architect, I was involved in telling an organization that they were going to change everything in their building, and a very senior person at the meeting started weeping in front of everyone. And it really led me to realize the important issue of how one does manage any change that one's trying to make. And you know, this represents the fact that, in, as in most populations, most people are going to be in the middle of a distribution and they're the people who say, oh, that's a good idea, tell me about it. Others will say no, others will say go. What we've learned from many studies of change management is that one really has to take many steps, take them slowly, make sure that senior management is engaged, and bring everyone along bit by bit until eventually you embed new behavior. But behind all of that, in the built environment, is the fact that the cultures are long, the buildings are around for a very long time, the weight of history is upon us, the weight of our cities and their fields are upon us, the weight of how buildings are arranged. So the challenge for us is to use existing facilities to actually make all sorts of good things happen in the future while respecting the weight of history and culture behind them.